welcome back to our workshop and uh, this session is a panel uh, with the kind of i put the title make internet decentralized again or path forward and uh, we have uh, four panelists uh, so i'll try to uh, start our panel with the self-introduction of uh, panelists we'll start with the job then hanging leash and uh, john okay yeah hi everyone look my name is jeff houston i'm the um, chief scientist at apnic uh, apnic is one of the regional internet registries uh, and it serves the asia pacific area uh, in terms of ip addressing um, so my interest uh, is actually around the area of internet infrastructure and in particular names and addresses um, i've been working on the internet since um, the early days of the internet in australia which is the late 1980s and uh, doing this job in APNIC um, for the last, oh God, 10 or 12 years. Um, prior to that, I was an architect at the uh, telco slash ISP in Australia, Telstra. Um, before that, I worked in the academic sector um, on the National Academic and Research Network in Australia. Um, I've done various things on the IAB and in the IETF and other, other spots. But uh, my interest is, is oddly enough economics, <laughs> um, purely as an amateur um, rather than uh, in, in this area that uh, I have certainly tried to apply economics to a lot of these topic areas. So that's me, back to you. Okay, Henry Schultzwini, I, I, I teach at Columbia University in computer science. I'm not quite as long as Jeff on internet related issues, but I did, I, my first IETF was somewhere in the early 90s, so been around a few years. Um, and uh, so my interests are, I uh, have traditionally been uh, internet applications, uh, real time and other uh, applications, but starting uh, in, again, maybe the early 2000s as, I internet evolved from a research artifact to largely infrastructure. Um, I had an increasing interest in um, the policy and larger economic aspects of it. So I have done stints basically from 2010 to 2017 uh, in the US uh, communications regulator of the Federal Communications Commission on and off, kind of alternating between my academic appointment and uh, the government job. And then last year, or the year from 2019, 2020, I spent one year as a staff member of one of the US senators, also working on communication related uh, policies. So I was involved, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, in, uh, defeating the .org transfer to a uh, private equity company, for example, uh, when the US government, when the Senate uh, and senators got involved in that particular fight, food fight. Uh, so my interests in general are on competition uh, and consumer facing aspects of the uh, internet as in I'm primarily concerned about how the internet looks to the vast majority of users, not just to hobbyists and technologists, but to kind of the, the people who uh, rely on uh, the internet in whatever shape uh, to do their mundane and maybe not so mundane tasks, uh, whether kind of a, earning a living or uh, to express themselves or to maybe uh, make progress on common challenges. Okay, thank you. And Lisha, maybe you can go next. Sure, um, I'll be quick. They are very different, I think, from the first two. I've always been in the trenches. I started, uh, I guess, the starting date is probably a little earlier than the others because uh, I, um, I went to MIT September 1981. I walked down to campus first in the EE, but I, I figured out one way to find out that Dave Clark, yeah, he said, here's the uh, RFCs half of print and you read it and tell me what you learn from it. That's the RFC 791 to 793, uh, TCP, IP, ICMP specification. That just started me on the protocol design career. And that's been 40 plus years 
I've been still working on that. And John, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Adler. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Celestia Labs. I'm chief research officer, where I do general applied research and protocol specification. Uh, previously to this, I was at, uh, sorry, I guess I've been doing this since early 2020. And uh, previously to this, I was at the, uh, the, the company called Consensus, or Consensus Systems, I think is a long, long form, uh, generally doing uh, decentralized uh, database research. And previously to this, I was doing my graduate studies at University of Toronto uh, in formal verification of hardware circuits. So I'm a little bit greener than the other panelists here. Yeah, but I hope you have like, some perspective on the block, additional perspective on blockchain <laughs> more than others. Thank you for everybody for the introducing themselves. And I'll try to dive into the questions that uh, kind of prepared. Uh, there are kind of several questions that we want to get like in general, but I'll try to start with a few uh, specific ones. And I don't know what the kind of order, just to try to jump in uh, in whatever order you want. Um, can you comment on the, what do you mean by internet centralization? So in your opinion, what is that, what are the dimensions of that? What are we exactly concern about when we talk about internet centralization? And maybe Henning, given you suggested this question, you can comment about this. Yep. So when we talk about centralization, I think we're talking uh, at least three dimensions and they have different consequences. And they're not independent, so they're not quite orthogonal uh, in that, uh, as in each one is likely, if they're not even more than that, they're likely as in you can't have one with, um, without the other. So the first one is, uh, do we have a capture of the technology itself by a relatively small number of entities. So this could be standardization in particular for those are standards-based or as we are experiencing for many applications, just simply the technology development. And I think about Zoom as an example uh, that we all come to rely on. Uh, the second one is control, uh, namely who actually controls the running of a technology, even assuming it's the technology is standardized and widely available um, as to what who actually operates that. And again, the example of the, the Bitcoin type thing, where a small number of entities control a distributed protocol uh, to some large extent. And then uh, thirdly, uh, is it is more technical, namely geographic and other distribution. Uh, in that is just uh, all control I mean, within a small location, so which means that it is subject to um, disruptions based on location. That's probably the least interesting one uh, among the three dimensions. In that. So control means also the economic control, naturally, as to who who is in charge of the business aspects as opposed to just simply running uh, nodes. Not. So that's, and then the consequences are, uh, like I mentioned in my introductory talk, is I think they're from a, again, focusing on the uh, consumer side is the resiliency aspect, as in uh, it is more likely that you have outages if you don't have a distributed um, system, but that's less clear in many cases. I think the, the trade-off is a little more uh, nuanced than that. Uh, you have uh, economic rent uh, seeking behavior as in entities essentially capture more of the economic value than a competitive market would indicate, not just on the consumer side, but on the other side of, of two-sided markets. And I uh, Thirdly, you have stagnation possibly because uh, the technology is driven by the interests in uh, a, 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 of a particular technology driver. Joe, Felicia, John, do you want to comment about this? Do you agree with what uh, Henning said? We want to add something? Um, I think I largely agree. Um, although I may change the word slightly. I think the centralization is really the result of consolidation. And the consolidation of the operations um, is really representing the power. 
uh, into a small number of uh, parties. And that led to this control in those small number of parties. Um, I think that uh, the world is always, for market economy, there's always the economy that just self-motivated and aggressively driven. So therefore, the regulations uh, that kind of confine that economical power. And I think of what happened why internet got consolidated is because a new technology showed up as a revolution. Uh, so the, you know, the smart people, smart people captured the opportunity and just uh, utilize the opportunity uh, to grow the market. And meanwhile, I think, like I said in the short white paper a year ago or sometime, that uh, because people didn't have the foresight to understand what may be coming and let alone the regulators. So normally you have the three like a stool, there's the economy, but there's the regulation and the technology. And uh, I think for the last uh, 10 years, it's essentially the market drives the, the field and regulation by and large, to my view, absent or otherwise did not recognize the most important factors to actually uh, consider exactly how to regulate. I think even for now, that's, that's a big open question. But I'm just saying that with this imbalance of the three legs of the stool, that's how the current world tilted into the consolidation and the centralized situation. Uh, I think that the technology, look at the, the papers in SICOM, that's where the network community look into. The papers most largely is really helping solve the problem of how we make the data centers running more efficiently. And I think at least my very limited knowledge did not uh, see the papers talking about how the, the users like you and me can still communicate freely without any dependency on one of those centralized cloud providers. And I think without the ability to freely communicate among the users, you essentially, end users essentially do not have power sometimes. And if I, I want to just ask a little bit more specific question about this is, what is the major concern about decentralization? So is it, so I think uh, Henning mentioned there is a stagnation of the, uh, Communicate uh, stagnation of the progress, um, getting be better value. Uh, is there security? Is there and there was a word control mentioned. Uh, so, what is the main concern, at least for you, like with the centralization? So, because we don't have a control or users don't have control, is that the main problem? Is the security the main problem? Longevity of the technology, uh, this is infrastructure's main problem, or all of this. <laughs> I don't see longevity as an issue. To my view, technology is human created that will change over time. This is not an option. Just like a biosystems, they will continue to evolve. That's not an option. And I think the fundamental question is the control. Who has the power? Um, I don't mean, mean to say uh, like Twitter did the wrong, wrong thing or not, 
but Twitter being such a powerful tool uh, that everyone relies on, they unilaterally decide uh, who can be cut off. I think that, that fact is a year ago, something uh, alarmed so many people to realize how much the control power of the internet has been centralized. And, and the- you, know, you know, nothing about this is novel. Absolutely nothing. When newspapers started to syndicate, guess what? Everyone got so worried that the Hearst Empire in the US or Rupert Murdoch's empire around the globe would, would seize minds and, and would effectively dictate what, what folk thought. Uh, radio, exactly the same concern. Television, exactly the same concern. So if, if the concern really is around seizing what we thought was a public asset and not only privatising it, but privatising it in the hands of very few, then we keep on repeating the same course of action. And at some point, it, it's not novel anymore. It's just the same old story again and again and again. Why should we be concerned about this? Well, it's kind of hard to get all that concerned. You know, oh, it stops innovation. Look, AT&T stopped innovation in the telephone system for nigh on 100 years. And I didn't see anyone complaining about that per se. They were more complaining about the usurious prices than they were about the fact that it was something you spoke into. You know, nothing changed. And, and indeed, the lack of change was meant to be an asset rather than, you know, a problem. So in some ways, what do you want? And, and, and if you want a service which, on the whole, is free, basically, you know, built by advertising markets and cross-subsidised like crazy, which is what consumers seem to want, then this is what they've got. And, and if there's a concern, it's kind of, well, you wanted deregulation, you wanted the user to drive this industry, they've driven it to somewhere that you don't like, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, it just means you personally don't like it. But... That's not a bad thing. That's just what users want. And, you know, trying to sort out where the public interest might lie versus where consumers are taking us is one of those more trickier parts to this whole issue. Um, you know, I would be much more concerned personally, much, much more concerned that Google have 92% share of all search it's a bit like we've taken the entire knowledge banks of humanity and, and made the front-end buffer something controlled by Google. Because if you can't search for it, it's not true anymore. It doesn't exist. And that's less of a technology issue than it is a straight-up, everyone uses one private service, and that private service has absolutely no public contract. Nothing. So we're all using it. We're all relying on it. We all believe it. Why? This seems crazy to me. But that sort of takes this thing about centrality down paths that, you know, is, is well, well divorced from the underlying technology platform of the communication system and more into when you deregulate, users get control because that's what markets focus on. And this is where you end up. Well, I mean, I, I want to push back on this because I don't think this is <laughs> um, because you're conflating that the intent of the user is what gets reflected. Indeed, I would argue that because of the inherent in, uh, power imbalances in that, you actually get what users have to put up with, not what they necessarily would want, uh, as in they don't really have a choice in the matter. I mean, like you said, you mentioned Google, uh, same totally true for social networks, certainly for other aspects in that, as in collectively, they would probably, if given a choice, prefer something different. Uh, they just don't have, individually, they cannot make that choice. It is I mean, at a different level, the same as saying, well, I, I mean, I, we want, most, many people would prefer something that looked, that provided some 
uh, function similar to Facebook, but would work differently, would have um, less privacy concern and so on. Uh, and so the question really is, how do you translate the individual user desires that if they could might express those or if they could make those uh, relevant into public policy. And that's where, yeah, you have deregulated it, but that wasn't necessarily based on some mind. Nobody was ever asked in, I mean, directly on that as to whether you would want to deregulate all of these internet companies, I mean, network neutrality, which is I mean, in the US kind of one form of uh, intent regulation uh, is quite popular. Uh, it just given the political system uh, did not get translated into well, under the previous administration into public policy uh, in that. So I would just push back on saying the users want this and the users are essentially I mean, kind of blame the user type of mode of a consumer or a citizen or whatever you want to say that. It is one where uh, individually users have very little power to affect that because it, it's a collective action problem. Uh, if I go to a better um, social media service or whatever it happens to be, um, that is, well, A, I would have to create it, uh, and B, uh, I would have to find my the other people I want to communicate with there, and that doesn't happen all by itself. Uh, and so... But, but, Henning, but, Henning, the entire model of Facebook is to keep you on Facebook longer to present more ads to you. If yep. you don't like it, go to some other site. And, and that's, that's true for you and me and everyone else. And so their entire model is actually pandering to what users want because that keeps them inside that app. And so I'm sure there's a team of psychologists. I'm sure there's a huge study on human nature, same as TikTok. It is addictive, but that's not saying anything other than we are addictive humans and we get addicted to this stuff. But you know, it's our choice. It always was. No one's holding a gun at my head to read Facebook or yours or anyone else's. You do it by choice. And, and it kind of saying, oh, well, choice is wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Takes me down a very odd place, Henning. I just don't see that, you know, the legitimacy in that kind of argument. I and mean, I don't want to dominate here completely, but I'm saying the, the notion is that the problem is not that people make choices. Uh, the problem is that they have no other uh, realistic choices. This is the same problem that we find, say, in uh, in food consumption. Yes, uh, processed foods are popular, but it is often one aspect is that um, other healthier foods are either not readily available or more expensive. And so uh, people who don't have a lot of income, they make that choice, but the choice is only because they don't really have other good options in that. I would pick on um, Henning's uh, last statement about the choices. Uh, I think for food, uh, the physical resources, uh, the, the, the cost, cost on that. So therefore, uh, maybe people are constrained by their economical limitations. Uh, for this uh, uh, online or cyberspace services, that's a different. And therefore, people currently don't have a choice. It's not because of physical resource limitation, but rather it's because technology limitation. We have not provided this distributed uh, social um, applications. There is a toy demos here and there I remember Memphis had a demonstration at the 2019 ICN conference, but that's just a demonstration. By and large, people do not have a choice. And that I think is a technical question that, that we, we should have, we should provide those choices. Uh, those are not, but the food choices with the hard physical limitations. And I would just support um, 
Jeff's statement about the Google's power. That just shows the, the concern about this is centralized control. So you only know the world through Google's eyes. Okay, I, I want to ask John if, if he wants to chip in on this question before moving forward. Yeah, sure. So uh, the other panelists brought up very good points that I, I mostly agree with. Uh, Alicia said it's, uh, it's all about control. As Jeff said, you know, Google has a huge amount of control over this thing. And as Henning said, yes, you always have the option to opt out, but you can't really opt in into anything else if there's no viable alternative. Uh, one thing that the Web3 movement, uh, which is, I guess, a politically correct term for blockchain stuff, uh, one thing that the Web3 movement is trying to em emphasize is that everything should be public and open source. So imagine if you know the entire Twitter code base from their servers to uh, how they handle authentication to their application were all open source. Uh, then I'm sure that you know we wouldn't have this this uh, this argument that you know there's no viable alternative to Twitter. That if Twitter censors you, that there's nowhere else you can go, because you know all the code is open source. Anyone could just spin up a viable alternative, pay a bit of server costs or whatever. Uh, Henning is shaking his head. Uh, I'll, I'll let you respond. It's just so long. It's just so long. Okay, oh, you can. You can finish. Please finish. Uh, no, I mean that's basically it. You can. I'll let you respond. So, I mean, this, I mean, this is a classical engineering notion where we focus on the software and the hardware. We know that the vast majority of operational cost of running any service that is scaled, so it deals with bad human behavior and all that, is the management uh, of the service operations side of it. So yes, you can set up a open source social media network. Gab, from what I understand, uses one of these uh, type of open source services. So you can do that is, you haven't, but you have achieved almost nothing. What you have achieved is that you now either rely on volunteer labor, uh, which in some cases works, namely to keep the platform free of bad actors, or that you have to hire somebody long-term to do that for you. And so now you have to go back to write the issue of who do you hire to do that? What control do users have of the actions of that entity? How many choices do they have? Uh, how socially beneficial is that actor? And all these non-technical issues that our second talk has earlier uh, alluded to um, in, uh, in the discussion of the DAO governance in that. So open source in and of itself, and this is one my way of, this is illustrative is you have uh, the new Trump social media network uses an open source um, social media platform. Good for them. I, I'm not sure the world is so much better off with that particular availability of open source that has, I'm not sure that it increases the uh, social value that is being created. Um, I, I, I have to say kind of I'm on the Henning's side. I think open source- It's six o'clock. Open source is a great tool, but uh, any tool can be used for different purposes. Uh, open source doesn't stop the propagation of fake news. Uh, open source does that too. So fundamentally, it goes back to the user who is using that open source tool. I, I don't know much about the Web3 details, but uh, if I heard it is based on the blockchain, and then my first reaction will be, where are the user's identities? If it is all hidden, then, then that by itself offered kind of a nice environment for the fake news to propagate because nobody knows who said what. I think part of the issue with this whole open part of this was actually a response to the computing and communications environment of the 1980s, where everything was basically vendor lock-in. And the real problem was the lack of interoperability, not with the fact that the software itself was also closed, but it kind of took open into this realm of going, well, 
it's proprietary technology and you can't use mine. And the reaction from the industry uh, and from government and from, if you will, uh, consumers was to create interoperable technologies because the 1980s was just a mess in terms of large-scale data communication systems. And, and out of that came this idea that open is good, but not necessarily. Open doesn't necessarily mean a healthy market. Open doesn't necessarily mean that there will be diverse and robust competition. All it means is that the terms of competition move elsewhere, away from a proprietary ownership of the underlying technology into a different forms of ownership and exploitation. So it doesn't necessarily cure the ill. And so open source has become a mantra. I might 88% of the world evidently use the Chrome browser. It's open source, but so what? Um, lots of folk use Apple's Mac. Evidently, that is open source somewhere. So what? Quick is open source. Doesn't make any difference. So a huge amount of this product is open source, but it doesn't alter the realities of the market behind it. Open was never the key to unlocking that market. The forces that drive aggregation and accumulation are incredibly different to that. And while folk thought it had something to do with vendor proprietary technology, as it turns out 20 years later, uh, it didn't and it doesn't. So open isn't really the key here. So I, I think uh, I just heard, not just in my opinion, very important part of, of the kind of a driving force is uh, uh, not openness for the interoperability. So I think this one is potentially the key point, but uh, that's my small uh, opinion. And I think we already uh, touched a lot about uh, the driving force for the centralization. So I put up uh, this slide and kind of, I put the comment that we discussed before about like what killed distributed SMTP, but you can comment about uh, any uh, any other aspect of internet, internet centralization, be it web or social media again. Um, so for this question, I just want to get the, uh, your opinion on um, either economical, societal, uh, technological issues. So what are all of them together driving uh, this centralization, uh, whether it's a uh, consolidation for the control, intentional control, or something just uh, happened naturally in a society. So I don't know who wants to start uh, for this one. And I think there's already some concept we we'll talk to, uh, but please jump in. You know, let me start with, with part of the issue here around what killed the fact that driving more and more complex send mail configurations. And oddly enough, there was one victory one absolute and complete victory for the decentralized model that won hands down, and it's malware. It's surprisingly easy for surprisingly many folk to behave in surprisingly bad ways. And by surprising, I mean massively disruptive bad ways. And it is an acute victory of the wrong form of a decentralized internet where annoying everyone else is surprisingly easy for all of us. You know, we each of us have this awesome power to be awesomely bad. And what we did by doing that is drive everyone in behind the castle walls. We drove content into content networks, not because, if you will, it was so much better there. It was because you were protected there your bank, your shop, your whatever it is, it was much harder to bring down. Why? Because we weren't getting any better at defeating malware. We were getting better at building massive systems to absorb it. The best defense we have against uh, DNS attacks is bigger DNS servers. And so guess what? There are remarkably few large-scale DNS hosting operations out there. Why? because they cost a fortune these days because the DOS attacks are so big. And the same happens with web hosting. And, and so the argument really is that the true victory of decentralization um, was actually malware and viruses. 
And oddly enough, the most effective defence, if you happen to be a provider of service, is centralised solutions that let you team up with others to build castles with walls so thick, you know, the cannon won't blow a hole in them. So you're sharing the costs of defence into these massive centralised systems. And it was this toxicity that gave us a helping hand to get into these current service architectures where a small number of folk simply host these enormous bulwarks and their defence against attack is absorption. We can't stop it, but we can make sure it doesn't disrupt. How do you do that? By making it even, you know, making the service platform so big, the attack just doesn't make any difference. So I think the driving force behind what killed it for SMTP was the ease of being bad, the victory of decentralized badness. No, I mean, I'll add maybe one more that uh, also for some services, not for all of them, mattered, namely uh, geographic distribution. So when CDNs, I think, besides with DDoS protection that it offered, it also offered, made it easy for a, let's say, local provider of information or e-commerce services to have a reasonable performance across the globe without themselves deploying compute infrastructure um, across a large geographic area. And so my enhanced speed of light type of issues make that attractive. I think that's a secondary factor. I don't think that's uh, complete compared to what Jeff said, it's certainly secondary. I don't want to downplay what you might call a convenience in that simply because the internet has is largely a consumer network, as in it's largely dominated by non-technical people. And unlike when, when like you just said, people like you and me, I kind of internally chuckled because we collectively on this panel, this workshop, are anything but the typical internet users. So if it is really only accessible to people like my like her and, and me and anybody else on the I, and, uh, assembled, well. That's interesting in some way, but probably doesn't really reflect what the convenience motivation is. Again, I'm, I don't want to blame users for that. It is simply the case that I mean, most people don't grow their own food. Most people don't build their own cars. Uh, most people I mean, don't install their own plumbing. Um, some people do. Uh, it is economics, just basic economic of specialization, which is as old as my organized economics is, will mean that uh, you'll also, you'll continue to have delegation of that functionality uh, to people and organizations that are better at it uh, than individuals and individual companies, smaller companies that don't really have an expertise in that particular area. And this is for security, but any of the other dimensions as well. So I don't think it's any of the uh, it's all of the above, and they interact in various odd ways. And I think to, to frame a little bit the discussion, not just about uh, uh, SMTP. So, for example, Amazon, which is like this centralized point for the online shopping. And it, I don't think it has anything to do about m malware, but uh, uh, it's a completely different angle about the centralization. Uh, I think uh, the Google centralization of the search is also not necessarily about malware or the um, other stuff. But uh, again, I, I agree with the job. And I think Alicia has a hand, so please. Yeah, I'd like to uh, actually follow up uh, Jeff's comment regarding the service, I mean, the email server in particular centralization. I think the number one is the, the lack of security on the internet that essentially made the originally distributed uh, SMTP server providers, like all the organizations, it's made it's difficult, costly, for them to provide the service. And so therefore, the, the big guys build strong castles uh, to defend the spams, DDoS, and other things. I just want to add one comment onto that. Those guys who build the big castles also need the money. So therefore they are not building the big, big castles to 
protect us, but it's actually for their own economical benefit. They, they actually utilize all the male contents uh, they collected and do the advertisement. I don't know, I don't think I'm the only one who have that experience. So whatever you say on the email, on the Gmail, uh, then you get corresponding solicitations on the advertisement. So, so we, uh, I think it's started with the lack of security that has all these detrimental consequences. And by today, we, we have no privacy. Uh, and uh, if this is the future, that is the mail services can only provide it by the centralized uh, monopoly. I do not believe regulation alone gonna give us back the privacy. You can make whatever rules you want to, but if the one guy who does the service, they will not be honestly to follow all the rules. I think that the danger is there. And so that's why so many people have so strong desire for decentralized services. I will just stop there for now. Yep. So uh, from the Web3 perspective, uh, or blockchain perspective, uh, I will say that uh, Jeff brought up good points about DDoS attacks. Uh, I don't think there's ever been any wide scale DDoS attack against any blockchain network ever. Uh, there have been denial of like regular denial of service attacks quite often, but those aren't anywhere near the same problem as a DDoS attack. Uh, it is a problem that you know the peer to peer nature of Web three systems doesn't inherently solve. Uh, so I'll casually sidestep it and say that you know it's a, it's a still an open problem that it hasn't been solved in in this domain. Uh, but there are other kind of uh, aspects of centralization, decentralization in the Web three ecosystem. Uh, the primary one that I see uh, is this notion of uh, is is tied to this notion of economics uh, because most Web three protocols blockchains uh, are usually associated with some form of digital currency. For instance, the Bitcoin network has the Bitcoin cryptocurrency, the Ethereum network has the Ether cryptocurrency, and so on. Uh, and generally, uh, what happens with these uh, protocols over time is that we see some sort of consolidation or concentration. Uh, in the users of the protocol that exclusively want uh, one instance of the protocol to be the only thing that exists, essentially. Uh, so in some ways, it mirrors uh, what's happening in the you know, Web 2 or more traditional world, uh, where you have you know, uh, things that start potentially, you know, there's many different options, but it consolidates over time into a smaller number of players. Uh, that is essentially also what's happening in the cryptocurrency space, uh, but it's happening through a slightly different means. It's happening through uh, this economic vector of people uh, gathering around and forming tribes around particular cryptocurrencies. I want to just take up that comment of, of Leisha's where she said uh, people have a strong desire for decentralized services and, and kind of question that with a couple of, of examples. Um, there were two pretty good CDN outages this year, um, certainly where I live in Australia and, in fact, the Asian region. Uh, the first was an outage from Fastly, uh, where they managed to fall over their own feet and bring down Fastly CDN for some hours. And then along came Akamai, which rolled out a change and the config was basically skewed. And again, it just broke all of Akamai. And of course, because Fastly and Akamai are very, very widely used because CDNs are highly centralized. And so the outage affected airline booking systems for those who were using them, um, banks, et cetera. It had a widespread impact across a whole bunch of people. Now, the reaction was not, oh, I'm using a CDN that's too big and too critical. I should go to a, a you know, do it myself. It wasn't. The reaction was, oh, Fastly's having problems and I'm on Fastly. How can I be on Fastly and Akamai and Amazon at the same time, please? They actually want to cover themselves by, if you will, centralizing even more just with the lot of them. Uh, this isn't just content. The DNS has seen it too. The big debate in DNSSEC, security for DNS right now, 
is not about DNSSEC per se. It's how can I have a signed domain served by multiple DNS providers? How can I give my zone keys to both Route 53 and NS1 and this and that, in other words, to multiple centralized providers? And so oddly enough, the trend is not towards more diversity and smaller. Uh, the trend is to consolidate those who are already in a central dominant position and further reinforce that dominance by effectively allowing them to form what in normal terms we would call a cartel. And so even the fundamental residual bits that theoretically Fastly and Akamai compete is being eroded into, well, Fastly and Akamai are part of basically a set of CDN providers who cooperate with each other in the friendliest of ways, and you end with total and complete monopolization. Now, in normal economic terms and in policy terms, this is the big red light, isn't it? This is the end point where the incumbents are now doing deals with each other and charting out the future. But what we've found, of course, is that the policy debate is so difficult in this space that policy is regressive, it's 10 years too late, and it just can't grapple with these issues. Even the EU with their GDPR, which was meant to sort of curb some of these views about data and allow some basic corporate responsibility, the massive fines that they thought were massive, pff, one week's revenue or less, it's just not an issue. It's cheaper to pay and certainly cheaper to pay lawyers than it is to comply. And so, you know, what's going on here is not that there's a counter push for decentralization, not at all. Oddly enough, where consumers go is actually they want more of it in response to the failings, not less, which I find weird, but that's the way I've read some of these outages this year. Thanks. So uh, if we can push back uh, on Jeff, first of all, what I said was not that the end users and desire decentralized service. I was saying end users desire privacy uh, and you cannot have true privacy by regulating one single monopoly. That is my belief. I would just also comment on what you just said of this existing behavior. What does all of that tell us? Security is the big, biggest problems for the internet today. It's everything is on this defense, defensive mode. So if Akamai cannot handle itself even, then they collaborate with their competitors to stand up against this massive attack against the internet. So uh, your example of uh, DSSEC problems just confirmed the, my another religion that is retrofit security into a already deployed infrastructure service does not work. Uh, that's what we have been trying to do. TCP IP, the whole protocol stack was built with no security. Now we try to just patch on security here and there. And uh, we can see there's one thing that stands for all, that is the TLS with CAs. Nothing else has worked. And, and it's a really huge, important paper to write. Talk about the investment. Does anyone know how much investment that has gone to the answer security extensions by the government, of course, and how much also have gone to the, the BGP security uh, protection? It's, it's, it's a huge number. I remember then back in 2000, yeah, the year 2000, the more than 20 years now, uh, we, we I was a part of this huge movement about DNSSEC and the BGPSEC. Um, and the 20 some years, God knows how many, how much total investment that I have gone into. And we can see what's the outcome. Uh, that we, we should, someone should try to write a paper on the license learned. I just wanted to maybe add something to 
privacy comments that were made in that. I, I'd argue that even in decentralized systems, privacy is often very difficult for users to uh, both observe, given when we inherent kind of hidden leak of data uh, that occurs, and uh, in and of itself, those decentralized systems don't necessarily, or more less centralized systems don't guarantee privacy. Most of the, many of the privacy violations, if you look at where GDPR enforcement action have been done, are often smaller companies that uh, violate, that have an incentive uh, to use user data in ways that the user did not condone or anticipate uh, in and of itself. And indeed, it is often easier, uh, if you can avoid regulatory capture, to go after a relatively small number of entities uh, that you can observe and that, that are readily uh, visible, as opposed to going after thousands of small entities in that. I mean, it's just the practical enforcement problems. I'm not saying it's easy uh, in that. Uh, and often what happens if you look at regulatory mechanisms and the GDPR as an example of that is that many of the small entities get exempted from those rules. So for like, good practical reasons, uh, so that if you had only small entities, then many of those protections would not apply. Uh, in that. So I'm less... I clear that purely from a privacy perspective, just the extreme set of distribution would actually help. Um, it is clearly easier if you have a number of mid-sized entities that can at least in part compete on um, privacy protections that they offer, that you do, you might get better outcomes. I mean, you see a little bit of that happen in the smartphone space where when at least Apple pretends, I think, largely uh, to offer a more private, a higher cost, more private solution. That's kind of at least the marketing pitch. We can I uh, probably debate elsewhere whether this is reflected in what they do, but uh, at least in, in some notion you have that, even though the market is clearly highly concentrated. So, uh, I would just say that uh, just because something is highly distributed doesn't necessarily make it more private um, and doesn't necessarily mean if you look at, for example, the history of a telephone regulation, many of the strongest privacy protections, what is known in the US as customer proprietary network information, CPNI, uh, which you could call one of the early private data protections were actually done in a monopoly area and era and generally seem to have worked out pretty well as in large fines were levied and generally speaking in the exception uh, co companies seem to adhere to those much better than say uh, current um, internet companies do. I, I would agree with uh, Hany on that. I think uh, when I talk about privacy, I specifically stated that if there's only one monopoly and you try to regulate, a question about the effectiveness. I think uh, I agree with the handling that you do need the competitions and that they actually going to watch each other's out. Uh, that would be a much better position or situation for the end users as opposed to a single monopoly. That's all my points. Uh, of course, nobody going to do the extreme situations regulating the, the population that doesn't work. So before I give word to Jeff, so I think having small number of competitors have a danger of them collaborating and doing it worse. <laughs> I think somebody already mentioned this today. Uh, so Jeff, please. Um, I'm going to follow up on, on what Alicia said of the extreme problems and cost in retrofitting security to some of these tools and, and, and uh, technologies. Uh, the DNS with DNSSEC, uh, BGP with Secure BGP, and indeed TCP and the evolution through TLS to Quick, And I suppose I'd make the point that each of those three, if you tried it to have designed it back then from scratch with security, you never would have. They were dauntingly bad problems in any case. And we subjected those protocols to the astonishing abuse 
of massive scaling. We spent all of our energy in the 90s and 2000s scaling this network by a factor of around a billion, possibly more. The fact that the DNS works at all is a miracle. The fact that it works within fractions of a second for almost every request is an astonishing miracle that no one ever designed in. It just is. Uh, making it secure as well is turning out to be a nightmare because our standards are now so high um, that no one's going to tolerate a slow but secure DNS. And I could say the same about BGP, and I could say the same about TCP, that in taking a highly ambitious set of goals in the first place and scaling it like crazy, we chose scaling over security, and now the retrofitting problem is astonishingly bad. So bad that I haven't actually seen approaches that no matter how you attack it, actually grapple with this problem. And so part of the issue, I think, Leisha, is we spent our time, our money and our concentration for almost two decades making it bigger and actually following the demand curve that was being built for us rather than you know, building it more secure and more robust, building it to serve the next million customers that week was kind of the problem at the time. And, and, you know, by the end result, the systems are so large that contemplating change is its own awesome problem itself. BGP is massive across 100,000 separate networks, separately operated, separately managed with different equipment. How would you do change in that system? None of us know anymore. Um, like I said, even DNSSEC is a miracle that it's there. I don't think it's going to ever be everywhere because the DNS is just resistant to that degree of change. So it's, it's sort of an interesting aspect there, there, Leisha, of how susceptible these central pivotal protocols are these days to fundamental change now that they're so big. Thanks. Okay, Leisha, I give you time to res quickly respond. So at least we agree, Jeff, that it's this next to impossibility to change the deployed large systems. Uh, but I should make it very clear, I have no means to suggest that IP should start with this security. That will not make it start. It's just like a, the biological evolution. You do the- It's 6.30. You take one form at the right time that allows you to grow. Uh, I think that the challenge you're facing the community is that now we have Security is the number one problem. What's the solution? And that's what I'm commenting to say retrofit seems uh, problematic. I think that TLS worked is solely because it's not a multi-party problem, but rather it's a, it's a two-party problem. And you get this uh, third party CA and, and people just, well, it's also out of the commercial mandate. You have to have a security connection. Um, that, Someone gonna write a, a long paper to explain how this SSL CA story uh, came up. It's like overnight equivalent to Yakov's three page, three napkins that made a BGP kind of a story. But I want to say is that we as uh, network researchers, we should recognize the, the nature's property. Uh, when we should do it as opposed to do something that against the nature. We need to do the simple protocols to get the internet started. But at this time, what's the right thing to do? Is the right thing to do the patch? We have the experience, how successful it is. But the right thing is really looking to, you know, how we move away from today's, this is such an insecure, I would say totally insecure system. Okay, that's a short enough or long enough. Sure. Uh before I give words to John, I just want to comment on uh, what Jeff said about the miracle that DNS is working very good today. Uh, at least without considering security, I think it's not too accident that it's working well. It's just accident that the design was uh, correct uh, to make to make sure that we can have this performance today. It was just uh, I mean, in, the interesting aspect that the caching was built in and there, uh, the replication was built in the protocol itself. So 
there is no miracle we can get this performance. The miracle we picked that protocol in the first place. And I think this also reflects Delicious' comment. If we had the miracle or correctly picked the maybe protocol uh, that can evolve to include security, naturally include the security, then maybe things went, went better. So I don't know whether I'm uh, saying this like a contradictory point to Lisha or Jeff. No, I agree with you. I think that I uh, talk about DNS. So being old enough, actually uh, witnessed the, the experience. Uh, at the time, the current design wasn't a kind of a favorite one, just like uh, John Pastel and Paul McPatris pushed it. They're in power to get it done. The, the, the number of at least a half dozen other proposals all insist that we need a consistency. So I remember Paul wrote specifically into the specification, I think the 882 was the first one, saying that there is no consistency across the globe at any given time. That led to the simplicity of the protocol. Had you down to that three phase commit consistency as many other proposals at the time, it, DNS wouldn't help being so successful. So, so I agree with you, um, Alex, the good systems need to have the good gene to start with. I, no, I think both in BGP and DNS's case, they sacrificed one of the essential elements that security tends to pin to which is authenticity of the original data item. Because in the DNS, you ask the recursive resolver, that's the end of the query. The recursive resolver starts, if you will, its own query that is not linked by chain to the original. And the same with BGP, updates don't go through routers. The update stops at the router, a new update starts. Now that's what makes it scale and what makes it fast. So if you break it down into individual elements, you can actually get something that can use caching, that can use speed in ways that are undreamt of previously. But what you lose is the ability to sign an artifact of data and push it through the system because that's normally what we do with security. This is what we like. This is the original data. I like it. Here's a signature. And both DNS and BGP deliberately sacrifice that in order to achieve scaling and speed. And sometimes those kinds of trade-offs, whether conscious or unconscious, have enormous impact further down the track. You know, they just do. I would just say DNS actually is the original data, uh, just the cached. BGP does modify the updates. Uh, <laughs> You can't see where your query goes, Leisha. It just ripples and pushes, and it's not your query anymore. You know, 40% of all DNS queries have no visible cause. They just don't. If you're an authoritative server, you know, we sit there and look at the roots and go, why did the root servers see upwards of 90% of their answers is no such domain? Because yeah, the DNS doesn't behave predictably. I think John has been trying to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, I think he has. Sorry, John. Yeah, so sorry for, for this. So John. Okay. Thanks, guys. So uh, I did want to bring up two points. The first is that, uh, as Jeff said in one of the first time he talked, there's nothing novel, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and a lot of the things we've seen in the Web3 ecosystem have been issuing uh, security and privacy and so on in favor of scale. Namely, there's a big problem in the Ethereum space where a lot of the uh, a lot of usage essentially is driven through centralized platforms such as Infura, and there's a few other ones. I'm just not blaming them or anything, just you know, naming some examples, uh, where essentially they just give you an unauthenticated HTTP response uh, of whatever data you want on the blockchain, which kind of goes counter to the whole point of the blockchain in the first place. Uh, this isn't necessarily what's going to end up being the dominant way of using blockchain in the future. It's just kind of the current, uh, kind of current state of affairs. Uh, the second point I was going to make is that uh, a lot of the things that blockchains were started with were cryptographic hashing and digital signatures. So uh, trading off secure, uh, sorry, trading off scale 
uh, in favor of security. So it's essentially taking the exact opposite trade-off of what we've seen in the traditional space, uh, where everything in the blockchain down to the last bit is hashed and digitally signed, and a user can authenticate and verify everything on the entire blockchain. So that does provide some very nice properties uh, that, if if leveraged, you know, could, could could be beneficial in terms of privacy and so on. But unfortunately, as I said, my first point, the way we've seen it used so far, those properties aren't leveraged, unfortunately. But I hope to see them leveraged more in the future. And one particularly interesting project for that, since we're talking about DNS and DNS security, is the Ethereum name service project, or ENS, which essentially runs a name service just like DNS, I guess, where you can resolve things and whatnot. And it runs it entirely within the Ethereum blockchain. So everything is you know, authenticated with signatures, hashes, and all that stuff. So it's essentially completely secure. Oh, obviously, as I said before, at the cost of scale for now, but people are uh, good, good people are working on the hard problem of scaling blockchains. With no further comments, I would like to move the last part of our discussion, last 20 minutes. Uh, to this question that I put uh, a while back. I think we already touched a little bit on it. Um, so this one uh, I put uh, right now on a, on a question is a technical solution, but you can also answer whether we already have some non-technical regulation solution that already kind of exists, but it's not yet adopted uh, to reduce centralization remove centralization, reduce rate of decentralization, because it's not necessarily we completely avoid the problem. So um, maybe this time Lisha can start. If you want to get me started first, I would say that this question came too early, I would say, to solve a problem. If I quote Einstein, that he has something basic size that if you understand the problem, uh, completely. That's already 99% of the solution. So I would have said that maybe the question before this one should be what are the root causes that got us here? We talk the phenomena, uh, but uh, you have to understand the root cause before you say which of the solutions gonna work. Like, for example, I take this ICN. ICN, when it started over decades ago, wasn't really considered, oh, we're going to solve the centralization problem. But today, I would be also among the groups believe this actually can make a big impact on it. So I can use that as an example to say that it's not so much you design a solution for this specific problem. But uh, if your design get that right gene, that will defeat the disease. Even though at the time of the design, you might not have recognized what that disease you're gonna fight in the future. That I would say. So I'll just give other people an opportunity before I know more things to say. I think Henning unmuted itself, himself. Yeah, I mean, again, like I mentioned in my introductory talk, like relying on some magic technology fix. Um, and I think Jeff alluded to that and maybe meant it a little different uh, in that is, uh, his, is ahistorical. Um, we've had, uh, even before the internet, uh, all the other technologies have uh, that initially had the promise of a decentralized uh, information space, broadly speaking, whether that is radio or television or telegraph or telephone, uh, which all in many ways started out in a very decentralized fashion, uh, become for a variety of reasons, uh, I mean, much more economically centralized, certainly, uh, in that, even though the technology may well have remained relatively distributed uh, in that. So my argument is that instead of waiting for some magic technology with when Web3 being the latest uh, incarnation of that technology-driven hope, is that we have a set of policy and regulatory mechanism that Unfortunately, I believe that the technology community has been 
hostile to, um, and for reasons I suspect there's a libertarian streak uh, in that community, uh, and obviously there's probably a sense of my a certain amount of hubris that I'm mean, they can deal with all of these things, and so why can't everybody else? Um, so that you have a sense that there are negative consequences that the current centralization and lack of competition incurs that we know how to deal with. Uh, we may not deal with it perfectly. Uh, we may not address the problem 100% and there may be side effects, but that's just human life. Uh, as in very few things we do I uh, like when perfectly have only positive effects and are perfectly predictable in the outcome. Oh, we just life doesn't work that way. Uh, is so I would argue that we should think about uh, collectively as to whatever kind of interventions, the kind of tra technical transparency, for example, uh, that is often part of a regulatory mechanism, but that often requires uh, technology support. Uh, to see what's going on in I mean, who is doing what type of thing, uh, the kind of technology mechanisms to enable uh, good actors to be identified, which often requires both technology and policy uh, in that, uh, the trade-offs of anonymity versus protection, uh, all of these things that we uh, should think about as to what are these problems that are caused by centralization and can we solve them before we reach some nirvana of a inherently non-centralizable protocol to which I would say, good luck with that. Uh, so I think we need to think much more rigorously about now, my, what we started the discussion with, namely, whatever negative consequences for consumers and other parts of the overall ecosystem. So this could be advertisers, it could be media, uh, that could be um, I mean, other businesses that are not in the IT space, uh, whatever negative consequences and what are the shorter term things that we can do both technology wise and in, and in not making bogus claims, oh, this will never scale or this can't work or whatever, uh, that have often accompanied the policy debates where when people are not in the tech space, are not being particularly helpful. They're just kind of making claims that turn out to be less than well-founded. I will, I will say that not everyone in the blockchain and Web3 space is a hardcore libertarian who wants governments to, to disappear. Uh, there are, there are, the, the, they exist, but the, I don't think they're actually that large a number. Uh, but I will say that blockchains are an, uh, inherently a solution to any problem, really, except for, I guess, how to, how to, how, you know, a blockchain. Uh, the, the reason is that they're basically just a tool to facilitate social coordination among en end users. They're not, uh, they're not a solution in and of themselves. Uh, the, you know, if you want to solve the centralization problem, which as we saw, I think the first question that was discussed, uh, what, under what dimensions it exists in, it exists under many dimensions, not just one. Uh, it's not just uh, it's not just a problem that can be solved with a, a single data structure. Uh, the solution does require other, other things. And as Henning mentioned, it does require things like uh, regulations. Uh, it does require cooperation from the, the government, essentially. Uh, it might require you know, economics. It might require public outreach and education for end users, you know, an increased awareness for privacy and security and stuff. It requires many things. Uh, a single technology is not the solution to this. And if you want to uh, know a bit more, my uh, grad school advisor, Andreas Venaris, is actually uh, making good headway in uh, the regulation space, the blockchain regulation space in Canada. So this is something that I um, you know, have some involvement, involvement in. Um, actually, um, just to have a quick comment on the Henning's uh, comments, uh, talking about whether there is a non-centralizable protocols. I don't think that's the right question uh, because Look at the, when the IP started, we said we build a decentralized system. What was decentralized? Connectivity. In those days, there's no service, no contents. So all you decentralized is just the connectivity compared to the old fashioned telephony. And today, uh, it's part of it because of that connectivity uh, based on IP. That's why. I think Jeff Houston uh, mentioned earlier that BGP, it seems, is still 
kind of a decentralized system because that connectivity, the decentralized business. What got centralized is not the IP changed anything, but rather people build applications on top of IP and that got decentralized. So we have to think about when you talk about centralization, what, what is the thing is? The networking moved up the ladder, moved to the application space. That's where all the controls is. That's where things matter. In day one, back in 1981, it is all about those like few thousand computers, how you can have them physically exchange data. Um, so I think a problem space changed. It's not so much the protocol is decentralized, it's not centralizable for now. I think that if we develop a new protocol that push the new generation of applications to be decentralized, I'm pretty sure 20 years down the road, someone figure out another way to centralize them. The market just have that ever ending drive for the larger scale, for the economy of scale. I'm done. I can actually maybe flip what you just said. Uh, you said like a new generation of applications, but on the flip side, if we try to adapt existing application using on a new architecture that we're talking about, we'll probably end up in the same place then. So would that be interesting conclusion as well? Like I said earlier that when IP came up, it wasn't from day one to say, we're gonna support the telecom phone calls. You cannot compete with the legacy on their part of the you know, bread and butter chain. Okay, you, you have new architecture that has solved new problems that current architecture cannot do as good a job. And so this is one thing that uh, I really wish people kind of uh, see that point. IP didn't start by just saying we can support phone calls in day one. As a matter of fact, the phone call is the last, last application hesitantly moved onto the internet when it was no longer economically feasible to run separate uh, the PTSN network anymore. I mean, I think we, we talked in, at least in the beginning about the Twitter, about uh, Google. Uh, I think I mentioned the Amazon as well. I mean, if you're talking about the application themselves. So those are applications that are centralized as the application, regardless what the network technology is, potentially. Would that be correct to say or not? Or those who look search, uh, if there's a different underlying architecture, whether it's a blockchain, ICN, peer-to-peer, -peer, whatever, uh, with the different approaches to security, like better decentralized approaches to security, then those would not have been implemented this way. Is it so something too hypothetical? Let, let, me, let okay. me try and help you here, because you know I sense you're struggling a little bit. Um, in a deregulated environment where there is no central orchestrator, we fired the telephone company, which was really the orchestrator of the entire network, all the suppliers built to their specs, you know, they organised the activity. Who does that for the internet? And the answer is well, nobody, absolutely nobody. Do what you want, absolutely what you want. If folk want to buy your service, success. If they don't, failure. But there's no orchestration other than a market. So anyone can propose a solution. So when you're saying, does this or that or anything else a promising technical solution to the centralization problem. Well, maybe, but that's not really the question. The question is whether anyone else is interested in solving it in that way. In other words, that's a market decision. Who's willing to invest at what level? Now, what decisions have we made in the last, I don't know, two or three decades here? The first decision is that networks don't matter anymore. They really don't. As you saw from the uh, Japanese talk uh, a couple of hours ago, we're collapsing the networks down. And the trip from the data center to the eyeball is between one and two ASs long because we've built such an abundant network, we can bring the content to the user. The network that used to carry the user to the service doesn't exist. The service is now at the user's doorstep. So we commoditize the network and we just don't care. We broke the V4 address plan. We ran out 10 years ago. We just don't care. We haven't even done V6 because we just don't care because 
It doesn't matter. The market has decided that gnats are just fine. Let's move on with our lives. It's a market decision. Platforms don't matter. Bill Gates used to be as rich as they come. Now he isn't. Why not? Because Windows isn't a force. Unix is kind of dominant in all its various flavours, but nobody cares because platforms aren't the key anymore. We commoditized it and we moved on. Do apps matter? Well, most apps are browser-based and most browser engines, there's only a few, as you saw in the slides again earlier today, and it's predominantly the Android engines, WebKit and a couple of others, and that's it. Commoditized, it doesn't matter anymore. So when you're saying what's a promising technical solution to the market, the market says it's all content. It's all in content. It's all in engaging eyeballs and doing advertising. It's all in content. That becomes highly centralized by its very nature, bizarrely. You know, and it's, it's way, way beyond a different networking technology, way beyond different platform and device technologies, way beyond different browser technologies, because ultimately it's all the same, you know. And, and we've kind of commoditized everything in our wake and the market fascination has moved further and further up this protocol stack. And, and no matter what might be promising, what will turn out getting investment and attention is up there at that level of content because that's the world we live in. You know, and, and it, it's kind of the whole new IP thing just strikes me as so regressive, as if networks are the answer anymore. They're not. Um, none of that stuff matters. And, and, you know, as I said, content is everything. So are we doomed? <laughs> that, that's why I'm, I'm trying to say, I, I think that uh, I agree with you first, that, you know, the new IP is total wasted effort uh, and misguided. But uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by content. Like, for example, is your smart home a contents? Is this a, all this weaker networking contents? Uh, so, so there's a question of what contents you're talking about. I don't think, well, I don't think Netflix is the whole internet. As a matter of fact, I think as the time goes, it probably is becoming less of attraction. The new, new and, applications can come. I'm value happy. and volume, value and volume in our separating leash when we're not quite sure where the money is. This whole Internet of Things, the smart home, is billions and billions of devices and processes, absolutely. But is it valuable versus a commodity utility? And I think the jury's out on that. What is I, the I just, value? If you already said it's a billions of billions of market, that is a market of value. What um, yes, value but it's, it, it's like water. You know, it's, it's just totally abundant. And therefore, of what value is that market? What attention will it get? Or will we just continue to use insecure, cruddy pieces of, of junk that we can stamp out in their astonishing volume? You know, like, no one cares about the quality of software in my light bulb, and nor should they, you know? And, and this is this argument of value versus volume, which I think is the argument today. It is the question. I think that, that answer may change. As people do all this machine learning and AI stuff, building this fancy home with this uh, AI. Ab absolutely, AI Leisha. Stuff. Yeah. If At humans all. stop programming, it, it all may change. Absolutely. Okay, I think we're very close to the end of the uh, our panel, and I think we could have went for another few hours. <laughs> so for the last three minutes, maybe each of you can just do the final words uh, of thinking about the internet decentralization problem. And we can just go Henning, Joe, John, and Lisha. Uh, yeah, let me maybe just say my one kind of comment that plays off a little bit of what Jeff said. Uh, I think there's a, even for non-libertarians, there seems to be this market fascination as if as the market is some um, neutral entity that just magically allows uh, new entrants. And if basically if something not, doesn't succeed, well, the market as some kind of, it's like nature uh, has decided that this is not uh, worthwhile. 
I think particularly in this, in this context of centralized control, uh, it is clear that this isn't a neutral type of force of nature that are governed by just some immutable laws. Uh, these are largely made by decisions that uh, individual governments made uh, well, collectively and individually or did not make in particular, often made by arguments uh, proposed by technologists. And, and so if we want to change the outcome, uh, we have to move away from this market fundamentalism where it is, well, if a more distributed system doesn't succeed or a more humane social media don't succeed, the market apparently has decided that this is the case. There are alternatives uh, that go beyond just uh, the notion that blockchains are going to magically create that, given that they're largely based on the notion of whoever has the most uh, Bitcoins gets to make the rules. Uh, and so we are back to an economic determination of uh, power uh, as opposed to something that is a more democratic version and a more human-oriented version of that. Uh, and with that, I pass on. Um, my turn is that I think we're doomed. I think we're completely doomed. Um, the only fundamental success, as I said before, in decentralization is malware. And, and quite frankly, we just don't have any defences. Um, the centralisation has created a massive downside in, in, if you will, societal effects. And quite frankly, governments have been blindsided. The public policy debate, which used to be so good at blessing reality, is now finding that reality is a problem and they're powerless. And, and so this is a terrible conjunction of pressures, uh, societal and technology-based, that we oddly enough have very few productive yeah, answers. Are. And uh, yes, with that, we're doomed. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was going to say that, oh, Jeff is, so, Jeff is so cynical. Surely he doesn't think that, you know, all is lost. But apparently, <laughs> apparently he does think we're doomed. Uh, when, when I design protocols, I generally try to make sure they're denial of service resistance. Uh, and I, I punt DDoS resistant to, uh, to, to, to future blockchain researchers, because it, 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 is, it is the hardest problem. Uh, that being said, the uh, blockchain space has grown from zero to about a trillion and a half, give or take maybe two trillion in market capitalization over the past 10 years. So uh, a lot of people are putting their money where their mouth is. Maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not something that you should ignore, essentially. And to very briefly counter some, some points that Henning made, uh, you, A, shouldn't uh, listen solely to loud libertarians on Twitter that, you know, rah, rah, how proof of work is actually a battery because they're idiots. Uh, and also, blockchains are tools to facilitate social coordination. They're not actually controlled by miners or by validators of proof of stake or by even coin owners. They're actually controlled by end users who can run open source software. Uh, yep, with that, if you guys want to know more about blockchain stuff, then feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. So in your opinion, we're not duped? <laughs> oh, uh, well, none of this solves the DDoS problem, so maybe Jeff is right. Listen. Okay, I think uh, for me, the first question about blockchain stuff is really the authentic identity question. Uh, the uh, Schreiner, uh, Schreiner, whatever, uh, wrote this book about the uh, Liars and outliers. And he had one sentence there struck me to say, the society is built on trust. And I, it's exact, I'm not exactly sure where, who is trusting whom in the blockchain. It's as if we trust the crypto and that doesn't make anyone feel comfortable. But back to my uh, concluding sentences, I would just want to say that architecture change comes from outside in. Uh, it's not that, that we're going to use a new way to build content distribution. That will not happen. I just said that from. I think that the new architecture has to enable new generations of applications. And that's where it is going to start from the edge and not from the center. I also noticed this is very related. There are really two communities of people. I think most people here if I get it right, it's kind of like myself, a network generators, I mean, network people. 
Uh, I think if you talk to the application people, whom we all agree, they are actually the drivers. And they have actually very fundamentally different view on how well could this internet work? How well could this internet make them happy? I think we really need to listen to those people who are on the frontier of application development. So on that. Okay, so with that, I would like to close the panel. I want to give a round of applause to our panelists because it was, I think, a really great discussion. And thank you.